So finally, Anwar Ibrahim has become uh, prime minister after all this time. But uh, ironically, he comes in with Pakistan Harapan with a weaker result than in the previous election. Can you unpack some of these trends that we are seeing here? Sure, Peter. Um, the, the thing is, what has happened with Pakatan Harapan is they have actually lost a lot of their Malay support. You know, they had about 25% of the Malay electorate supporting them in 2018. And because of some policy missteps, um, they lost about half of that. So now it's estimated between, you know, Mr. Bridget Welsh says about 11%. I think it's maybe closer to 13 or 14% of total Malay support. It's come down quite a bit. So that's why, you know, uh, the PKR lost quite a number of their Malay seats, including, you know, Nurul Iza, who's, you know, the, a star in, in, in a very well-known daughter of Anwar and in the family family seat, you know, so, and she lost that seat. And people like Mahfuz, Omar, senior Amana people, uh, Mujahid, another senior Amana person, Hatta, so a lot of the Malay majority seats that they contested and won the last time around, they lost. But having said that, um, there was tremendous uh, non-Malay support. Tremendous non-Malay support for Pakatan Harapan. And the fact that AMNO imploded, the vote for AMNO just crumbled. It was, it was like 80% about 20 years ago, the vote, Malay vote for AMNO. Uh, at the time of the Malacca uh, state elections in uh, at the end of 2021, it was down about 45% of the Malays who were still voting AMNO. But this time around, it's gone down to about 25%. It's really crumbled. And I think it's because of um, the perceived corruption and the fact that the current AMNO leadership is still rallying around those who are perceived to be corrupt and trying to say it's all political persecution and you know, that, so that I think, uh, even to the Malay supporters of AMNO, that was unacceptable to them. So they couldn't bring themselves to vote AMNO. At the same time, they've been fed this propaganda that the Pakatan Harapan, the PH, is under the control of DAPE and has got nothing but ill intention towards the Malays and Islam. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the narrative going around. That the DAP is really out to, to undermine, you know, um, Malay interests and, and 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 the religion and I mean, so so that thing so so they couldn't bring themselves to trust Arapan, so they went to what was best, the Bursatu and uh, pass in the Perikatan National, and and those guys did very well, much better than I think even they expected, you know, they did really well. And so, so it's so it's for, for Pakat and Harapan, they are lucky. They are lucky that this happened. I mean, otherwise, on their own electoral strength, they wouldn't have won. It's because the, the, the Malay vote was so split that they were they managed to win. And even now it's on a very shaky footing. Because you can never know when when this Barisan national guys will pull the plug. They may well do it, you know. And uh, especially if the PAS and Bursatu managed to launch a campaign uh, saying that, look, look, you're already selling up to Chinese interests and all that. And if even more Malays start leaving the Pakatan BN, you know, just like Bursatu, I think Bursatu left the Pakatan coalition in early 2020. I think it's partly or maybe largely because of the fact they noted that their water base was moving away. They were losing their waters. So to stay alive, to stay to stay relevant, they, they, they had to move, you know. I mean, of course, maybe they wanted to get into power and things like that, but but you know, the, the, the shift of the waters made a made a big difference for them. So the same situation that affected Bursatu as a Malay partner within the Pakatan may also come into bear when Barisan notes that the Pakatan, uh, the Parikatan is able to sway even more voters away from Pakatan Harapan and they may feel we better go, even the 25% that we now have will come down even further, you know, so they may leave because of that reason. This analysis seems to uh, ride quite heavily on 
the a very racialized pattern of voting. Would you say that um, it is it's just a continuation of the pattern that has been an unfortunate legacy of Malaysia from colonial times? Or has there been a worsening of this um, racialization of politics in G15? At, at, at independence, the most powerful opposition was the, the Socialist Front, the Party Rakyat Malaysia and the Labour Party. And for the first uh, 15, 13 years after independence, they were the main, main, main um, contest at the polls. So though the ruling party was um, uh, race-based, ethnic-based, you know, the AMNO, MIC, and MCA for the Chinese, the opposition was class-based, you know, PRM and Labour Front. And so the, the politics were a bit different. But when the Socialist Front collapsed at the end of the 60s because of massive state repression, then even the opposition then became DAP and PAS, Islamic party as well as a mainly Chinese party you know, taking up Chinese interests. And so from 1970 to now, we had 50 years of very racialized, ethnicized politics. In 2018, when Pakatan took over, had Pakatan been able to consolidate its Malay support, had they uh, uh, held back, basically they cut a lot of subsidies to the Malay poor, which I think came off very badly. Uh, they also talked about uh, Malaysian Malaysia and that you know even the Malays are immigrants as you know they came from Sumatra and they came from Kalimantan and so you're also immigrants and that went across very badly because when you say everyone is immigrant when the Malays are immigrant equal to the Chinese and the Indians then the the, the basis for Malay being the national language the basis for Islam being the religion of the federation the basis for the special provisions special uh, position of the Malays, the basis for the sultans, Malay, Malay rulers, is all undermined. Because, I mean, you're equally immigrants, so why should you get anything extra from what I get? I mean, that's the subtext of it, you know? So these are the kind of things they, they were a bit too exuberant. And, and as a result, Malays left, you know? And of course, these things were seized upon by the, by the opposition then, Amno and Pass, and they went to town. And it's created that impression. So, in 2018 was the inflection point. If the Pakatan had come in and was able to assuage Malay fears, look into uh, the legitimate Malay, Malay, Malay interests, like, I mean, the Malays still are among the largest group of poor people in this country. I mean, you know, if you look into things like that, you know, you might have won them over, is it? But yeah, so they didn't do that. So actually, the, the politics has actually become even more. Uh, racial, in the sense that Pakatan Harapan now has got a larger, you know, it's more more non-Malay supporters, much more non-Malay supporters proportionally compared to 2018. So the, the single biggest beneficiary of the swing away from AMNO and from Barisan National seems to be Party Islam or PAS. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. so is there... Um, a more religious identity emerging now that is competing uh, with the, the old um, ethnic-based identities? Or is this a continuation of the same thing? I think it's more a continuation, you know. Surveys done even three, four years back have a lot of Malays, Malays even younger people saying they identify themselves as Muslim first. And then Malay second, and then it's Malaysians third, you know. So that, that thing has been there. But this uprise in the vote for pass from about 20 seats to about now 41 seats, that, that jump is more because they were part of the Parikata National and they were the only place the Malays could go. They didn't want AMNO because of corruption. They couldn't trust Pakatan Harappan because of its perceived bias towards non Malays. They had to come to Perikatan and where past to Bursatu didn't stand because they are their partners. So all those votes we saw for pass may not necessarily mean those people are out and out, out Islamists. But definitely, I mean, Islam is very important to the Malay population. 
is a part of the identity. One feature of the the the, the last election was the large numbers of uh, younger voters. I believe about 29% of all voters were under the age of 13. And there were a lot of first time voters coming in uh, because of the uh, over 18s allowed to vote. Um, do you think there's uh, any patterns with these young voters that have shown up in the results of the election? Not the, the preliminary findings seem to show that they voted as their parents did. You know, so they followed the same kind of pattern. In a, in a, in a non Malay majority area, the voters tended to vote more for Pakatan, whichever age group. Which, because in Malaysia, you can do that because there are different streams going by the IC number, which is then that's age based. So you can compare the, 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 the younger streams with the older streams. It's a pattern, it's, it's about the same. You know, they tended to vote as an ethnic group. There has been a kind of um, assumption that uh, certainly in the global south, you could assert a national identity that would be cover all different ethnicities, religions, etc. But there's a new, you know, the actual experience of uh, post-colonial period, which we've all lived through, has shown that this actually turns out to be much more challenging and problematic than could be imagined. There are so many countries that have had independence that are then fractured into ethnicities, uh, religious groups, etc. And, uh, you know, does it call for some new thinking, you know, to break out of the narrow paradigms of national consciousness nas going with national liberation? Yeah, definitely. I think the whole uh, bourgeois system of polit politicking and the way in which it's very, very much easier for people to mobilize people on uh, racial perceptions, uh, perceived uh, uh, actions that put your race in a, in a bad position and all that. You know, it's so much easier. Look at Sri Lanka, for example, you know, and Malaysia as well, many places. So the struggle for parties like us is to try and highlight uh, social economic issues. So we've been canvassing things like pension, old age pension, which is going to help everyone. We are talking about extending the, the social uh, safety net by getting the government to contribute towards the social security fund so that if anyone gets a serious illness, they'll be covered. You know, the, so that, that. So we're trying to do things like that to try and mobilize people to understand that these are things that are going to affect all of us, you know, healthcare, for example, asking for a larger health budget. It has got traction, you know, and those kind of things do have some traction. But uh, if someone misplaces the race card, and, you know, it's so much easier to mobilize along those lines. So even within our party, you know, the PSM, a lot of our members also tend to fall back to uh, ethnic based analysis. It's quite natural because I mean, 50 years we've been schooled in this by the political process. So it cannot really... So we need to have a different process. And it's not just a question of writing articles and talking. You've got to get people involved in struggles. You know, because as Rosa Luxemburg said, it's, it's, the, it's the mass strike. It's the struggle that changes consciousness. Not the, not, not the pamphlet you read. Anwar Ibrahim is a sort of a icon of reformacy. But how... What chance is there of rekindling reformacy? I mean, in even in in the results of the previous election in G14, I think you could say that while the Pakatan Harapan advance was based on you know an unprecedented mass democratic movement around the birthday movement, by the time the election came on, that movement, uh, the movement in the streets, had pretty much demobilized. So what is the situation, you know, with uh, a reformacy movement after GE18, where you are now having an even a longer period since uh, there were last large numbers of people in the street? I think you've got to break it down, you know, Peter, because if you look at Malaysia, you have four different things. One is um, race relations. And I think the Pakatan will try to be more accommodative, but carefully so not to 
spook the Malay population. Uh, second thing is religion, how punitive, how conservative, you know, how doctrinaire you're going to be. And I think the Pakatan Harapan, the Amana people, the people in Anwas Gadilan are, are more open. They're more, they're more inclusive. They're not so narrow in their thinking. Then, of course, governance. I think there, I think we'll see some changes. In fact, already in the last five years, we've seen changes. The 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 up to eighteen uh, voting voting thing, the the party hopping laws. There's some things that have changed, and I think you can see more changes in that. The fourth aspect of that is the neoliberal orientation. There, I'm not too hopeful because the Pakatan generally tends to be even more neoliberal mm. than the people replaced, because the Malay-based parties don't really trust the market too much and see the need for the government to intervene to make sure that Malay interests are not left behind. And the non-Malay parties, DAP, for example, supports the CPTPP because they feel that at least then let the outsiders put the barriers and, 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 and limit this government's scope for using government power to, to discriminate towards a particular race. So they are for it, you see. So I think the neoliberal part of it, I think we're going to have problems because they, they believe in the market solving issues. Uh, that's both PKR, Anwar's party, as well as DAP. So right now we are involved in a campaign asking them not to ratify the CPTPP. Mm. Because the papers were signed by the last government. It's going to be ratified. I think tomorrow will take effect. So we are having a mobilization now to try and stop that. If... If if Anwar is a sort of icon of reformasi, um, another icon was was Mohammed Mahathir, and he got completely obliterated, and even lost yeah. his not only lost his seat but lost his deposit. Uh, what is yes. that telling us? It shows that you can't fool all the people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, you know he was he was playing a double game really. You know he was playing a double game, and so. So basically, he managed to piss off people from both sides now, and people don't trust him, you know. So, uh, yeah. Do you, do you think uh, Pakatan uh, politicians have learned lessons from the, you know, the experience of the of the split in 20, 2020? One lesson that they really should learn is that you need to inculcate, you need to build your Malay support. And in so doing, you don't go and trim or cut down the programs that were giving sub subsidies or assistance to the, to the Malay B40, the bottom 40%. For example, they cut the fishermen subsidies. The year they came into power, they just cut the fishermen subsidies. They cut the, uh, the top up they had for rubber small holders. Whenever the price went below a certain, certain level, the, the state will kick in and put a bit of money depending on how much rubber you sold. Um, things like that. The, the, the cash benefits, they cut down the number of people getting cash benefits. Now, these are the kind of things you you should not do, you know, because that makes people worry. You know? I mean, so, so I hope they've learned that because though the PSM has been talking about this ever since that time, they've never actually acknowledged it openly, but they don't have to. Like, I guess this song as they understand it, they don't redo it, it'll be good, you know, for them. And good for now, us as well, you know. Or well, the PSM decided not to run in Sungai Seafood, where you held that seat for, for, for two two rounds. Um, and uh, this was after uh, Pakatan uh, refused to to allocate any seats in any form of electoral pact. Um, now, it would seem to be that it would have been a, a good thing if Pakatan Harapan had agreed to allow you to be the candidate uh, for Sungai Siput. I mean, if it would have been a, a good gesture of inclusion, but also you would have been uh, uh, be able to make a valuable uh, contribution in addressing some of the real contradictions that uh, they face in government today. Um, do you have any regrets not standing, or do you think that was uh, the best thing to do? If I had stood, Peter, and if I had taken away just about 2,000 votes, then Pakatan would have lost that particular seat. Mm. And a lot of the people who supported me when I won for two terms would be quite pissed off with me. 
for coming in and, and allowing the person they didn't want to win at all, the other side, to win. So I wouldn't have got very much uh, appreciation for doing that. I wouldn't have helped the party in any way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't been able to win that seat. And if we had met and we had got, got done well enough, in our terms, get more votes, and the Pakatan guy lost, people will be saying, oh, very good, your votes have increased. No, they'll be saying, you stupid fellow, why did you come in and do this, you know? So I, I don't think it would have helped us very much to do that. None of us won the elections, we're not in parliament, but we are in the thick of things, you know, because there are issues to take up and we don't need to be in parliament to take up. The first few days of the Anwar Ibrahim government, he's done some, uh, some things that have at least uh, s- symbolic significance. Uh, the most latest one is the, the Camry, Toyota Camry, uh, rather than a Mercedes-Benz choice. But perhaps um, more significant is him going after uh, um, Brekata Nationals Muidin on the corruption front. How significant do you think that could be if they pursued it further? Is PN as guilty of uh, corrupt behaviour uh, in the last period, as uh, Barisan was, or do they are they still able to present themselves as clean? I don't know. You know, I don't know whether during the lockdown and COVID times, whether or not there was massive filtering. There could have been some. I mean, that's how politics is done in this country. You know, and all of them have been doing it. And if even even uh, Pakatan Harapan has got to be careful because the way the system is set up, you know, it, 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 it goes towards that. I don't know. And I think it can potentially backfire because, I mean, after all, it's only 11% of the Malay vote voted for Pakatan Harapan. And if the perception is you are doing a witch hunt, I think that'll be, that'll be dangerous. And especially you don't do it to your BN because you're your partners, but you go, go against past and Bursatu, then, you know, so I think he's, he's got to tread carefully there. Uh, if he can't afford, or Anwar can't afford to be seen to be going soft on uh, Barisan National and Amno in particular, particularly mm-hmm. the, the the leaders who are, you know, going through the court cases, I mean, that would be a poison chalice, surely. Mm. Yes. But it's a kind of a tight, tight rope. If we don't give Zahir a seat because he's got a court case, then how about uh, one in? Or mm. how about the Muda president? Mm. You know, if you think they're okay, you know, but you, you, then it looks a bit funny, isn't it? It's, a, mm. quite, it's quite a, I don't know how he's going to, he's got a lot of problems on his hands, uh, how he's going to handle it. I'm sure it's uh, not going to be a smooth ride for this new government. And uh, it is really good to see that uh, grassroots parties like uh, PSM you know, the election is over, but the real politics is continuing for you. So congratulations yes. on uh, getting back to the real business. And thanks for speaking to me. Thank you, Peter.